so um, we are starting again um, a panel uh, um, about the DIY culture and new utopias. Uh, it's a mixed presentation um, of mixed uh, authors. Adrian Burnham, Pascal Facher, and Adam. I will um, um, put some... <laughs> Adam, you could, oh, no hope. Yeah, it's the AK. Uh, I will just um, uh, tell some words about each of these authors and then they will present in a sequence. After that, um, there will be a panel debate with Carlo that's there on the door and everyone can um, put some questions and, and talk. Uh, so, uh, Adrian uh, Burnham, um, after 10 years leading courses and lecturing on art and design in Acne Community College, in June uh, 2016, founded and continues to create Fling, Fling Lips. Flying Lips, sorry. Flaming Lips, I love them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Adrian, it's here. And, um, well, it's a street display online. And... Um, then uh, we have Pascal Fauchier. Um, you worked for 15 years in inter international banking and finance. Okay. And then... <laughs> That's it. And then he's now he's founder and manager of Urban Spree that is dedicated to urban culture through exhibitions, wall painting and artistic residences. Uh, no hope. Um, Adam, <laughs> well, uh, developed the visual iconography and language, document the notion of collective human struggle, uh, visually touches uh, the emotional conditions. He currently lives and works in Tel Aviv. Okay, so please, Adrian, thank you. Hello, hello. Um, yeah, uh, as Pedro said, my name's Adrian, and uh, I started a project where I invited artists to send me their images, and I get them made into street posters and fly posted in London, Manchester, Glasgow, Bristol. We're sort of spreading out slowly. A um, little quote from an old fly posting friend There's nothing romantic or daring or edgy about it. You're fucking sticking bits of paper to a fucking wall, that's all. Um, I'm going to go through some images and hopefully we'll tease out some more nuanced readings of uh, fly posting. So this is uh, a picture from, a dodgy picture from Elizabeth E. Guffey's book, Posters. And I wanted to use this just to represent the sort of value of spaces on walls and... Uh, obviously the value to fly posters, but also the value to advertisers and how sort of hotly contested these spaces are. Flying Leaps um, kicked off with an image by artists you might be familiar with. This is Kennard Phillips, study for a head seven. Um, Kennard Phillips are Peter Kennard and Cat Phillips, well-known sort of activist, artists. I think they were here last year. And this is one in a series of works they did. They did it a long time before I actually got it on the walls, but we chose it in sort of January of um, 2016. I launched on the 23rd of June 2016, which was the um, day of the EU referendum. Pretty, um, in a way, prescient image because Cameron lost the referendum and resigned, and in a sense, I think the image chimes with both Cameron's hubris and also the sort of powers that be that supported his, his Tory party. Sorry. In uh, Kennard Phillips' own words, the work is made as a critical tool that connects to international movements for social and political change. We don't see the work as separate to social and political movements that are confronting established political and economic systems. We see it as part of those movements 
the visual arm of protest. Uh, someone who's been quite inspiring to me is um, Richard Sennett's writing, uh, his uses of disorder in 1970, which celebrates the sort of somewhat scruffy cities uh, and his conscience of the eye, which looks at how we how we um, how cities grow. He also kind of alerted me to Ferdinand Tony's formulation of society as divided into two social groupings: the community and the society. And I'd argue that large-scale outdoor advertising is kind of related to the, the society, the sort of mute element of exchange, whilst flyer posting, I think, is much more to do with community. It's about face-to-face -face engagement. It's about interaction in the street. And offers a kind of, I think, a more porous experience. There's, and there's also a sort of conceit, it might be altogether true, it might not be altogether true, but this idea that flyer posting is quite a democratic medium in a sense, anyone can get out there and get sort of words on the street. Um, I use, I piggyback uh, existing fly posting systems. So I'm a bit of a hybrid, really. I'm not a kind of a, a radical intervener on the street. I use um, poster drums in, in Glasgow. You know, I think it's a good way to sort of get yourself into geographical locations and and have something up there in the street other than adverts. Even if it is an advert for my sort of poster project. This is a piece by an artist called Michael Peel. Um, I was a fly poster myself in the mid to late 80s and into the 90s, working for both Hackney Council, um, for commercial music um, operations, but also working for artists as well. So I, I sort of crossed the the gamut of legal to illegal stuff, which I quite liked kind of balancing out those kind of elements. This is his Object 2 and Of The State, which went up in 1989. I put this one up in Soho for him, but it was all over the place. Uh, yeah, sorry. I should say a little bit more about Michael Peel. Um, his work was put up uh, in London, Brixton, as I say, but he also had exhibitions in the ICA um, in London at Kettle's Yard, uh, Kettle's Yard in Cambridge. But um, more importantly, more inspiring for me, he went over to Northern Ireland and started putting up poster projects in the street in Derry during the time of the Troubles. And uh, it's a pretty um, important way of sort of reaching other communities apart from through sort of art institutions, I think. Um, this is by uh, Carrie, uh, a project with her partner Bob Osborne. She's off doing her ceramic um, mosaic workshop, so she's not here, so I won't embarrass her, but I do think it's a very strong image. I like the kind of... Um, there's a play there, really. She's using sort of uh, girly kind of pin-up imagery that sort of harks back to 40s, 50s and 60s. And uh, on the surface, perhaps a more kind of innocent time, but of course it wasn't really. I think it's generally accepted women were almost second-class citizens in those days, and I think she plays with those sort of tensions. I also um, like the idea of kind of putting ridiculously large kind of objects back into the urban environment. And as I say, I will get stuff onto billboards if I can, as well as doing the sort of street postering. I shoplift, therefore I am. Uh, it's an interesting concept, especially when you think of the UK as like the fifth richest, largest economy in the, in the world. And the many people, not just homeless people, um, but you know, professional people, single mothers, having to rely on food banks. And I think that's... Something about the idea of Carrie and Bob suggesting that you might be forced to define yourself as a kind of a shoplifter. You know, it's not just kind of the down and out people who are having to do that. It's, uh, it's becoming more mainstream, which I think she's alluding to in this piece. I suppose one of the things I've been thinking about is what captures our attention on the street. 
in a sense, you've got the kind of engagement of a, of a, of a strong image. Um, you've also got to think, as everyone probably does in this room, but I'm not sure about outside, about where, where you position things, you know, the context, the location, in terms of how efficacious it is in getting through to people. It's not just this idea of getting single images up, which obviously capture people's imagination. If it's part of a big show, then you know, images, any image can get lost. But also, you know, if you go and stick a poster on the headquarters of the Royal Bank of Scotland in Bishopsgate, uh, which is a sort of London business district, it's seen as an act of transgression. Whereas if you put it on a fence in a suburb, it's very much a sort of different kind of operation. So I'm sort of dealing with those kind of things all the time. And in a sense, we do kind of have to deal with some of the same things that advertising does. So saturation and cross-platform um, kind of awareness is important. And a later example, we'll look at that a bit more carefully. This was the artist Michael Peel I was talking about before. Um, here he's combining Thatcher and Theresa May. Another Flying Leaps artist is uh, a guy you may have heard of called Mustafa Halusi. Um, these went up in the sort of late 90s, his Expander series. And I think one of the things that they do is, is kind of act as kind of tactical pointers to sort of ask the question of passers-by, you know, what it is are you looking at? What, who, who's kind of vying for attention for your, for, who's vying for your attention in the urban environment? A much more recent work around 2014-15. Behind this image, there's issues of a divided Cyprus, wastage in the global food industry, the sort of human promise left to kind of moulder and rot through lack of opportunity. Um, but what Halus is also pointing to is the fact that geographical media, fly posting, can can possibly be said to be on the way out, may, maybe. This is kind of subsumed by digitalization in the 21st century. Um, a shift from collective to individualized communication that will, uh, that will just afford advertiser and advertisers even more control. And it's this idea of moving towards smart billboards where they'll be able to sort of individually target you as, 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 as you go past is on, is, is on the way. It's already here in some senses. The way Mustafa Halusi sees it, the poster as rotting fruit and vice versa stands as an anti always switched on gesture. Maybe melancholic like Turner's The Fighting Tamaria, signifying the ending of one age and the beginning of another. Uh, this is another of his pieces where he's taken the bark, so the image is not great. He's taken images of bark from Cyprius trees and then really fly posted them into London in, in, in the East End. I think one of the things he's trying to sort of suggest is that, you know, there's no outside neoliberal society, but perhaps his olive trees kind of inserted into contemporary urban environment. At least they propose an amendment to the status quo. Uh, and, and maybe we're desperately in need of that at the very least. This is uh, an image by another Flying Leaps artist, Dolores de Sade. Perhaps not as overtly political as some of the other pieces, but um, I think her kind of exquisite mark making and the sort of images that she makes talk about the power of environments and how they can affect our, our psyche. This is uh, Marcus Harvey's The Island, which I think of as a fantastic portrait of um, post-Brexit Britain, really, that kind of Tower of Babel or sort of scrofulous, corrupt kind of pile in the middle of a black, kind of inky black sea. Again, I think um, what fly posting can do is that we can get into sort of urban centres and, I mean, I know it's not contributing a kind of very happy image, but I think it's something that you know people may or may not notice and think about. This is a piece by a, an artist called Mark Titchener. I don't know if you know him; he's he's pretty well known. He um, 
nicks his words from uh, CIA manuals that have been sort of um, disused. He also kind of borrows from um, ridiculous self-help books and uh, outmoded sort of psychological theory. But I think they're quite enigmatic sort of insertions into the urban environment. He's not trying to sort of tell you what to think. He's, he's prompting kind of, uh, you know, asking questions about what is truth. And I think that's something that has been on our minds, especially since the sort of rise of Trump. This is a, a, a pan, panoramic shot. The funny thing, the nice thing about um, doing the project is A, being invited to talk at places like this, but also another curator saw this poster at the end of his street and he thought, oh yeah, I'll try and include that in, a, in, a, in an exhibition. Central St. Martin's Art School, there's a kind of a, a space in the middle that they call the street. It's a real kind of ersatz kind of um, atmosphere. And the uh, curator thought, oh, if we stick some fly posting on the windows outside, then it will make it more real. And um, I'm not sure he quite succeeded in that, but it was, a, it was a nice idea. Another artist that new art people will be familiar with, um, Robert Montgomery's Psychic Love Wave. As usual, he sort of uh, puts forward a somewhat utopian kind of notion, but I think seeded into the urban environment and put together with sort of uh, the kind of detritus and writing around it. I think they kind of act as a, a, an antidotal message to, um, to power. I haven't really advertised Flying Leaps at all. What I try and do is uh, write about the artists I'm working with and hopefully persuade publications to mention Flying Leaps at the end. So. That's, that's my effort at advertising. That's probably why I left that. This is another Rob, Robert Montgomery piece. Um, probably around 2012. And this was about five minutes away from the college where I worked, so I have to probably uh, say that Robert Montgomery's was a bit of a, a kind of a an inspiration for Flying Leaps. But also the funny thing is that more than 20 years ago, I negotiated with Railtrack to let fly posters use this board. It was about the first time that, okay. Robert Montgomery again, together with um, the second Kennard Phillips image. This is uh, Theresa May blinded. And probably the most successful poster, the Jeremy Della, um, Strong and Stable My Ass, which I actually saw people put their shopping down and laugh themselves silly when they saw this image. People interacted with it. Fly Posting is able to get into places that other advertisers and artists can't reach. And interaction on quite a sort of extreme scale. Builders painted one out. Someone came back and sort of faithfully reproduced the image afterwards, which I thought was um, showed commitment. I'm not sure. I mean, after hearing Bayer yesterday, obviously some art, activist art, does speak directly to people. I think in the context of the UK, that's less of less the issue. All we can do really is affect the public's disposition. We can nudge people. We can corral kind of um, certain sorts of ideas and hopes. I also like the way that the climate and people act on posters in the urban environment. You won't be surprised here, I'm a fan of uh, Mimo Rotella. And drawing to a close, this is Mark McGowan, also known as the artist taxi driver, who's doing a brilliant job in uh, compiling an oral history of people's reactions to Brexit. He's working on a two-year project to do that. But he also does ridiculous rants every morning from his taxi cab. An extremely committed and voluble um, political mover and shaker. And then in the evenings, he goes home and he does these very beautiful, tender, naive little watercolors. Um, there's, a very, there's a lot in there. You should really check out his watercolors. There's links on, on the Flying Leaps website and some very kind of subtle, interesting imagery. 
So um, what power do I have? Really, a combination of accident and uh, experience means that I can invite artists or some would say hassle them to give me images to get on the street, but I think they do make a sort of pleasant change from some of the other things. It's a challenge, but it's also quite exciting. Finally, um, the artist taxi driver's spirit of hope. Thanks for your time. Good morning, or good afternoon. Um, today I'm going to talk about the place I've, I've founded and managed, which is called Urban Spree or Urban Spree in German, um, which is located in Berlin, and um, which could serve here today as an example of a do-it-yourself, grassroots, um, let's say, artist-managed or community-managed place. But um, first of all, <clears throat> like the, the location, this is very important because Berlin, if you know um, the city, is um, is very very special and has a huge influence as a, as let's say as a grassroots city, as a as a as an affordable artist creative city, into into shaping um, your the destiny of the place you want to do. So my vision before coming to Berlin was to create a very open space where artists have a prominent role and in effect Berlin was a perfect choice because it exemplifies that and you just need to find a proper location to um, to project your dream. And just as a side example, here on the Warschauer Straße, which is one of the biggest arteries, one of the hearts of Berlin, which has many, um, there is a world famous um, skateboard benches. So they are public benches. And it's really, really world famous. All the big guys are, are skating there when they come to Berlin. And one of the reasons is because, it told me, there is a supermarket open 24 hours with beer. Um, it's perfectly skatable, <laughs> and uh, nobody gives a shit about, about skating. So it's perfectly open, and Berlin has a huge respect if you do something authentic and genuine, and they would absolutely respect that. Um, but a bit of, of um, um, topographics, this is called RAV, uh, which stands for Reichsbahnsausbesserungswerk, which is, um, let's say, <laughs> The, the maintenance and repair yards for trains, which were um, started in the late 19th century under the Prussian regime and, and through different incarnations, ended up miserably in 90 after the fall of the wall because it was so obsolete that um, when Deutsche Bahn got it, because it's East Germany, East Berlin, well, they just left it abandoned. And it was therefore colonized slowly by, let's say, grassroots association people, activists or artists, to occupy this huge, enormous compound of 70,000 square meters to create like um, a school of circus. There was uh, a famous um, um, water tank, a water vasatum, transformed into a um, climbing wall. And all these kind of um, social, local, child-friendly activities were developed in a squat basis. And um, it continued for a bit until Deutsche Bahn decided to sell the whole place to private interest. That was in 2007. And since that time, it has been flipped through several range of investors because they want to build high-rise buildings and make the most out of it. And they just can't because the city hall is so far very protective, but that might not last. But so, just the idea is like, um, we are part of something bigger, bigger than us, uh, which has a longer history, because we just came in 2012. But this part where we are, which is the lower part, it's like 2,000 square meters, um, and it's facing the street, which has a direct influence for street art. Um, this was abandoned for five years. I think it was squatted, and it was like rehearsal studios. There was a lot of 
punk leftovers, but it was closed and it was in a kind of bad shape. And as Pedro hinted, I had some kind of background in like banking and finance. So, but I really wanted to change and do something very much uh, from, from the bottom. But I had some capital thanks to Deutsche Bank, who just fired me. Um, and therefore, I had capacity to build something, to start something, because uh, this place needed some, some renovation. And that was important. So um, this is a kind of um, one of my artists designing the, the place for one of his books. Um, it is kind of, as the RAV is a big ecosystem, we're like a small ecosystem. We are uh, we're having the beer garden, so the minimal proposal in Berlin, just come and have a beer. It works all the time. Um, we have the gallery here on the lower floor and the bookshop, which is together. Um, this big, uh, fat um, German GDR um, building is uh, where there's a concert room in the, in the ground floor. It's like 250 people capacity. And upstairs is artist studios, including the screen print studio. And this is very important. It serves as like a nucleus of what we do because we are not cut off from the artists. They just live with us. They just irrigate the place with creativity and with, with, with all what they produce. And so, uh, and it's very organic. It's, it's not like it was done in one day and then we just operate it. it it's done every day. So we added some, some food units after, like a tattoo studio after. Um, and it's just, we're just making the place better or trying to improve it every day. So it's like a growing construction. Um, and also very important, it's, uh, it's self-financed. We don't want to depend on public subsidies. So we just don't look for them. We don't ask for public money or private money. We have a mixed system whereby the beer garden, I mean the sale of beer, which is quite, um, quite important in summer, um, enables us to get the cash flows to pay for the art program. So the art program, this is very, it's a crucial point, has no commercial pressure. There is no objective of profitability on the gallery or the bookshop on my part. So it's a space dedicated to what I like or the artists I like. I want to invite them, I want to create. I mean, not to create, but to... to uh, so that they create in the space and to do what they want. And sellable, we don't care. It's like, it's cool if, if we can sell if, for the artist and it's always good, but it's not the main point. And on the, um, on the side, so on the, on the right side, where it's written concert room, you have the big wall. And this big wall is facing, so Warschauer Straße with like 100,000 people a day passing by, which means more at night, actually, in Berlin. <laughs> and this is a big wall. It's like 15 by 8 meters. And it changes, changes for every exhibition. That was one of the last one with Jim Avignon. It's, um, very important artist from the late 80s, 90s in Berlin. He's, he's, he has painted the wall extensively at the time. And he's also a big, known as a decorator for all these quartet techno clubs of the early 90s. So he's kind of figure. And he has a, he's been describing himself as a kind of Picasso under acid. So I guess Carlo will appreciate. <laughs> um, and so the wall is being done like every, almost every month in summer. Um, and it goes on par with exhibitions. So actually my goal is to have this big wall that you can see from the street, it's quite obvious. And it serves as a first contact with the public, with art. So you walk and if you're hooked by something you see, then you're just welcome to get inside and discover what the art artist has been doing. So it's a kind of using street art as a as for the scale, for the amplitude and magnitude and the, and the beauty of it, but also proposing inside a more like a format more suited for gallery. So we play on both sides, indoor, outdoor. But also we, we love to do like a bit of crazy uh, grassroots stuff. So for example, this one was curated by Discreet, Australian artist who live in London and me. And we gather, there was like uh, 90 artists involved uh, which had to pair. So we had like 45 artworks and 19 of them came to Berlin to paint everything. It was, and they came, like Paul Insect came, so he was doing this um, square, pop, square bob, uh, you know, that is um, sponge guy. Um, <laughs> and there was Rekha doing some kind of kung fu style, which is absolutely not his indoor style. And so they all came just to, to have fun. 
And um, this is something that a gallery won't allow so much because maybe you see lack of time and you don't sell anything. But for the artist and the, and the vibrant side of the place, it is, it is very important. Um, and see, these are the front entrance of the gallery. So everything was totally painted. It was uh, quite massive. But most importantly, it was, it was mostly, let's say, self-organized with just the goal of doing something cool and, and big. Um, this is also current show. So this is Real Z, a Swiss typographer. Uh, he's with us since five years, and it's quite important. He's one of the resident artists. And you know, we don't really rent the studios. It's more like it's supposed to be 100 euro per month. But um, actually, it doesn't pay since five years, just because it, it tr we trade with signs. You know, he's a super good typographer. Oh, Cyril, I, I need a menu. I need, you know, please make me a little sign. OK, so that's the kind of cool arrangements we have. That was just a picture of his latest show. I was about to show you some, some videos, but the um, connection doesn't work. Um, this is also one part of an exhibition. Just to show you that inside doesn't need to be fucked up to be, to be good. But that was uh, Tomek, so he's a French uh, post graffiti artist from the Pal Crew, very important. Um, and um, so the result is proper, it's very, really, very really good. It's really, really I like gesture, flow, big formats, 220 by 260, can't sell, almost doesn't get through the door. Um, but before that, it was like, like the gallery was in a mess. So this is what we like to do. We invite the artists, they stay with us three weeks, one month, whatever, and then they use the space to create something. And we try to do that more and more rather than just hanging stuff on the wall, which is super cool as well, but a bit dead. And in that, that case, we just see the artists uh, doing, creating, and we leave that with them. And that's uh, super important. And um, so this is another wall by 2-1. This is a good example of the residency. 2-1 is a Japanese artist based in Berlin. And um, he spent three weeks, so he has a studio in Berlin. And, but the, the whole idea was like, get out of your studio, come to our place. It's just like three kilometers away, but still. And, and do something. So there was a wall on the program, but also there was a huge residency with a lot of canvases indoors and a lot of energy, collaborations with some friends. And this was so intense and he was so into it that it's, it changed a bit his practice. At the beginning, he was pretty much following his studio routine, just doing what, what he knows how to do. But then there was another guy coming from Japan, which is pretty Japanese, like, was very intense, uh, doing some, I don't know, so it was crazy stuff. And he, it was collaboration transformed him, and what he produced after was absolutely spectacular. And this is one of the goals, is to try to emulate, so the result they do is, is, is striking. That was supposed to be video here as well, but um, it doesn't work. Uh, this is a studio with Real Z on the left and Andrea Wan, she's an illustrator from, from Vancouver. Um, so they just, they're just there and they are very important. Also, they produce things like um, it was a book we published on the theme of wilderness, like wild. And we asked like 40 artists we like to, to contribute. And this is a self publishing part, this is do it yourself culture. Um, it's like um, we have the bookshop, and in the bookshop, we try to have a maximum of self-publications like zines or also screen printed stuff because we have the studio upstairs and so um, this is just generated by by what we do it it comes instantly to mind that we have to do that we have to publish books and we just sell them in the shop and so the artist parkour can do like you do a wall or you can do an exhibition or you can do a zine or or a book and it's kind of um, special this is the last one we we're publishing that's more like a proper book with Tavar Zavatsky. Uh, before it was known as Above, so it's a um, Californian artist. It's our next show, so we're publishing the book as well. This is a screen print studio with Dolly De Moretti. She was um, a known screen printer in England with pictures on the walls. She was one of the main uh, uh, printers with Ben Ein. And she moved to Berlin like seven years ago, and she's with us since the beginning. And this is also important because we can control the production. So um, everything, I mean, not everything, but a lot of things that we do are um, generated and produced in-house, so we can control. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's what the screen print we did. It was like a series 
of a kind of imaginary Berlin landscape done by the French guy and it was printed with just the yellow of the Uban, which is a train. And we asked like 20 graffiti guys, like really active and very famous in, in Berlin, to do something. So it's just a funny picture because the guy is doing the, he's working on his prints on the subway, which is like his office for a graffiti guy. <laughs> and this is the beer garden, when there are some, some people. Um, and so that's very important. Um, this is like the, the economic engine of the place. So it's a mix between entertainment and culture. You need both because if you have only culture in Berlin, you just don't survive very long because uh, it's not a real market for art. Um, but it's, it's a good market for entertainment and like beer drinking. So you have to mix both, otherwise you don't survive or do commercial things. So this is a compromise we have, but we don't. We are still. Um, we don't have any like beer um, contract with anyone. We just. We have no branding. We just. There's no Marlboro uh, umbrellas. You won't see that. And just to finish with, um, we're just like an excerpt of the Instagram hashtag. I think when you have a place, I can show you any kind of pictures you want and say yeah, it's very cool. But at the end of the day, you have to to rely on new technology, like if you do the hashtag urban spree on, on Instagram, or if you do Google image, then you will see what the place really looks like and what the people think about you. And that's, that's quite important. Um, it's just the first page I just screenshot today. So it's a concert of yesterday, I guess. Uh, and we have like 16,000 picture hashtag, which means there are way more, which are not hashtag. Um, and if you go through when you have time or whatever, um, then you can see what it's about, like concerts, happy people having a beer, but 80% of the feed, 80% is just about art. They are taking pictures of walls, taking pictures of the pieces in the gallery or the books. It's very, very much cultural. And this is a great part about Berlin. It's like it's still, let's say, not a rich city, but it's a very curious city. And people are eager for consuming art. And this is the kind of thing we are like trying to propose on a cool way or lo-fi way, low density. Yep. Thanks. Yeah, so it, um, I put it on auto play because I'm terrible at multitasking. So it'll be better if I just look at you guys. Imagine you're all naked. And then uh, and every once in a while when I stop talking, it means that I'm changing the slide. Uh, my name is Adam. Uh, I go under the artist's name of No Hope, spelled uh, K-N-O-W. Um, I am based in Tel Aviv. I grew up in California. Um, I'll kind of start with a, a general kind of background um, about myself. I started working, I've, I've always made art my whole life, um, and it was when I started working in public space that it really changed the way that I perceived the creative process. Um, it gave um, a function to the art. Um, it allowed dialogue, it allowed this broad conversation, it allowed to be part of a collective reality and to kind of um, 
become an organic part of, of, of a local reality. Over the past 12, 13 years or so, I developed this iconography, a visual language um, that I use to not only communicate with the viewer, but to um, kind of document real life situations that I see around me and uh, kind of translate them into, into um, a more universal realm or a less specific realm. So all of, all of the, the images or scenes depicted in these images are, um, are based on real life observations and things that I kind of see around that I later translate into something um, that can be, that can communicate something more akin to a uh, kind of collective human notion. Um, so my work kind of is divided between studio practice and outdoor work. And um, I think the order is kind of mixed up, so never mind. We'll just kind of like cruise through it. Um, after a while of working um, out, outside, then I, I started to feel that there was something that was uh, a bit didactic uh, about image making in public space. Um, it really dictated kind of what the, not the hierarchy, but what everyone's role was. So when someone sees a mural painted on a wall, then it's clear that an artist made it, and I'm the artist, and everyone else is the viewer. And I really feel that the strongest metaphors um, are in real life. They're in the daily human interactions. It's in, and, and we're a very significant part of kind of creating, an integral part of creating the reality of the places that we live in. Uh, just by kind of daily interactions, saying thank you, please, smiling to someone. Um, but also kind of in our uh, less kind of aware actions that we, that we you know, the, the, the way that we conduct ourselves in, in society. And that's what kind of led me uh, to going back to text pieces. When I first started working on the street, then it was primarily text-based. It was very kind of associative writing, um, stream of consciousness. Um, and I felt that kind of revisiting that mindset from a different uh, standing point was uh, the most organic and honest and authentic thing that I could do in public space. Um, so when I write Overcoming on a Wall, the, the text is not the piece, but it's more um, all the, the kind of human situations that happen next to us. Uh, of course, none of it's um, staged or anything. So it's kind of, and because it's in public space, then there are endless images that are created. So for me, the artwork is not the text, but it's more uh, allowing the viewer to take an active part in the creation of the image. Uh, essentially suggesting Im an image opposed to illustrating it. Um, later on, as I started kind of revisiting my text pieces more and more, then it led me uh, to, to want to go more, even closer to the source. Um, these are just examples of kind of iconography based work. I don't know what's next. It all kind of got messed up. But I'll just flick through it and then try to connect the, the project to the to the image uh, wherever we wherever we are in the slideshow. Um, which led me to a project called Truth and Method, which is where I, I took these phrases that I would be writing in, in different locations in a site-specific manner, and I put out open calls for people to uh, get tattooed by me. And my intention there was to, uh, you know, th these sessions are very intimate sessions, very, uh, people uh, are very vulnerable in them. Um, and I, I wanted to put out an open call because I didn't want it to be people that I know personally. I wanted it to be people that aren't from my social circle, um, that it would kind of allow a more objective interaction. And um, I would essentially hand poke these uh, phrases onto people's arms and chests and different uh, parts of their body and uh, document them in their daily life, uh, allowing, it's all messed up. Never mind. Um, allowing their personal narratives to kind of create new images. So as in public space, uh, there are many interactions, then every action that that person um, 
kind of takes creates a new image. So if I write a minor refusal on someone's arm, then every time that person shakes someone's hand, that's an image. Uh, their kid falls asleep on the sofa and they carry them up, that's another image. And because it's somewhat permanent in the tattoo, then uh, there's a whole lifetime of, of images that will be created and also kind of beckons the, the viewer to take an active part in the creation of the image. Um, here's another example of, of, a, of a different project. Essentially, the Truth and Method project allows me to distance myself from being the sole author of the image um, and kind of having this, the exclusive, uh, being the exclusive spokesperson. Um, which is something that I, again, started to feel kind of uncomfortable with, with my uh, image-based work. Uh, this is from a project called Taking Sides, um, where I kind of raise questions about the notions of territory, uh, of how we create ideologies, how we um, form allegiances. So it's a series of interventions uh, that I've done in various cities around the world. Uh, this is kind of like the most classic one, which is our side, their side, but other times it's, it's usually kind of between two, two separate mindsets or two separate realities. And then I just stand there with a the camera and let the images kind of present themselves. So again, none of this is staged, but I don't think I could have asked for a better metaphor, um, which kind of, you know, as, a, as an artist and as an image maker, really changed the way that I perceived my, my role. Uh, the more I understood it, the more I wanted to step back and interfere uh, less. Um, another project is called Vicariously Speaking. Um, there are a lot of co commonalities to the different projects. It's, uh, it's all generally about using text and, and placing it in different contexts and recontextualizing it. Uh, this is from a project that I started about two years ago in Nashville called Vicariously Speaking. Um, so for the past two years, I've been corresponding with inmates that are currently on death row in a Nashville prison. Um, they're all handwritten letters. Um, I didn't know, I didn't do any background information, uh, research about any of the people that I'm corresponding with. I only know their names. Um, I don't know what they're, what they're in for. I don't know anything besides the information that they provide to me, uh, because I kind of wanted to also arrive uh, to this dialogue from a more objective and kind of um, unassuming place. Uh, so we've been corresponding for about two years now um, about anything. It, it ranges from uh, philosophical discussions to um, the reflections as uh, like kind of like a newborn activist, social activist, and some people we just talk about dominoes and how the game went at the same day. Um, and what I've been doing is I've, I've been extracting phrases or fragments of sentences from, um, from their letters and um, the first stage of the project was to create a series of billboards around the city. For me, it's always been important to try to address uh, political or social issues from a human standing point because I feel that they're are a lot of potholes in the way that political discourse takes place. Um, I feel that it often falls into an us and them mentality. And so what I'm trying to do with these types of projects is allow a participation in, in this discussion from an intuitive place. So when taken out of context, no one really knows where this, uh, who originally said this sentence. Um, I interviewed people on the street there I'm going to try to find that one image. It's not here. Four minutes. Four minutes? Okay. Um, let me regroup real quick. Um, there was one that said, falter in my struggle. And I interviewed uh, people walking on the street. And one person said, uh, you know, what, what their thoughts are about the billboard, what connotations, what associations they had to it. And uh, one person said that he's, he's been through a lot, of, um, a lot of hardships in life and he's done a lot of things that, he, that, he doesn't, uh, that he's not proud of, but it's always kind of like a work in progress. And it's important to not, um, to not falter in our struggle to better ourselves. 
And, uh, and I thought that was interesting because it, it's kind of like this unassuming and uh, kind of more honest uh, or intuitive connection to a sentence and relation to the, to, the, to the phrase that was originally written that I don't think would have happened if uh, he knew that it was uh, written by an inmate that is currently on death row. Um, because of all these preconceived notions about, and so it, it, it's about kind of humanizing and creating connections between separate realities. Um, how much time do I have left now? Two minutes. Two minutes? Okay. Uh, these are, I'm going to show you some examples of, of the Truth and Method project, just so it can kind of uh, give a uh, visual. Um, so this is a series, it's an ongoing, all these projects are ongoing projects. Um, so the documentation uh, has been taking place now for about three years and I kind of revisit the tattooed individuals, uh, photograph them, interview them. So I'm basically building kind of like an archive and seeing how their long-term process and emotional uh, transitions have an effect on uh, the meaning, the ever-changing meaning of the text. Uh, I've done similar projects with uh, in my recent exhibition um, called It Took Me Till Now to Find You, which was based on letters written by Israelis and Palestinians, um, later extracting their phrases and placing them on replicas of the segregation wall, um, also trying to kind of allow a more intuitive participation or discussion um, about these political issues, uh, which I feel allows... Um, empathy to be a part of it. Um, sorry, I didn't, I forgot to flip the slides. This one says, our inside showing. Um, and it was originally, the above piece is uh, in Tunisia, and it was written in 2014 while there was a war between Israel and Palestine, as uh, attacks in Gaza. And here it got a completely more um, intimate uh, meaning uh, this was uh, a woman that was nursing her son for the last time and she wanted me to document it. Um, so it's just creating these different juxtapositions between um, different interpretations and different meanings. Uh, sorry if it was a bit scattered, I was kind of thrown off. Um, but I think that's, that's it. Here's one of the pieces from my uh, last show. That's it. <laughs> now we'll have the the round table. Uh, it's a square table. A square table or a table. And I invite you uh, three to sit, and Carol will. I take lap dance. A exactly. <laughs> and Colonel will. You fit three? You need it? Yeah. yeah. You can do it. Okay. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Do we need mics? Yeah, I guess we do. So, uh, this is really fun. I love these guys. Uh, we're going to drive cross country after this. We have an odd. Uh, uh, I, I think it's kind of nice. Uh, I mean, I didn't put this together, but I'm really glad the way it gelled because we have, if we're going to be uh, kind of Marxist about it, we actually have the, the full spectrum of production to distribution going here. So uh, it's, it's a, a kind of capitalist model of these things, but uh, it, of course it's really much more about community. And I think that, uh, I mean, new art's really special in so many ways. And this New Art Plus program is kind of really interesting in that way for bringing all these people together. And I, we think about the academics bringing their theory, and then, it's, of course, it's always about the artists. But there's all these, I mean, I hate using the word professionals because most of them, you're all pretty unprofessional, really. But, but we do have these people who are in, uh, in this world of getting it out there. And I think that's what I have in common with you guys is that basically... What we do, we do for the artists, uh, and in this incredible way. And I'm not sure people always pay attention to that. So, 
like right now the art world's, I've been around long enough, it's, this is the third contraction I see it's going through. And we have all these galleries starting to close. And then I, I talk to my friends who are the dealers, and the only thing that's really breaking their heart is not the failed business, is like, whoa, that's like 12 people who've been counting on me for their careers. And, and so I, maybe you guys can talk a little bit about why you do this stuff for artists, and then Adam, you can talk as an artist about what it's like working with these people, like whether it's Martin here or, or what, you know, what you're doing with the fly posting, what you're doing with your gallery. It's like it's this kind of network of people who are working so hard to try to get this art out there and sacrifice you make. Are we sharing one mic? No. no good. Yeah, well, good. good. Go yeah, for, for me, clearly, it's, um, it's, uh, it stems from being a big fan like an, a personal fan, having another job, other preoccupations, but like seeing street art as it was unfolding on the, on the walls of my city and other cities. And at one point you take the, the leap to just do a place where you will be able to, um, to invite artists and, and like live the dream. So it's really like I, I will only work with the people I love I love their work, but also their personality. And we know it's going to work. And this is this um, enthusiasm of um, having being surrounded by great artists and seeing the gestures, seeing the involvement, the commitment, and, and having a result. That's, that's just wonderful. Yeah, uh, I concur. Um, I only work with people who inspire me, who... Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that I go out and handpick people. Sometimes people approach me and surprise me with work that I wouldn't normally expect to curate. So I think that's quite an exciting thing to be able to do, working with the unexpected. Working with, you know, why do people buy the Jeremy Della poster? Partly because you don't get much A-list art for 30 quid. Um, partly because, you know, he is the past master at kind of finding a form that suits his message. And the fly posting form for that particular piece of work was, was perfect for him. It got him, got him noticed in the way that he wanted to get noticed. So working with that spectrum of people, for me it sounds corny, but it's, it's quite a privilege. I mean, sometimes the artists, um, you know, drop off the work. I don't really hear from them again because they're pretty busy unless I email them and say, how's it going, you know, what, what's up? But um, either way, it's, it's just great to work with people who are, who are inspired and inspiring. Um, yeah, that's good. Um, I think for me as an artist, it's about finding uh, the right partners, uh, people that can either share a vision or can encourage uh, a process to take place because my work is so process-based then, and it's kind of like these long-term projects um, it's about finding people that, that can work together with me on this. Uh, I think it's very different in uh, places that aren't focused on selling and, and uh, because I think the, the commercial art market really adds a whole layer of, uh, of simultaneously complications, but also it enables a lot of things. Um, I didn't mention that as, as any jab at the commercial uh, art world because I partake in it massively. Not massively. I, I, well, what's funny is I, the art I, market so, so. thinks we're the commercial people. Even though they're making all the money, it's like, oh, that street art is kind of commercial. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think that, you know, for me, it's always been less about, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an artist and I need to find ways to make things a reality. And uh, and if I can find collaborators on that, then that's great. Collaborators, I, th I think we're more like enablers, but yes. Um, and then an interesting thing, and I think it's an, a nice aspect of new art is, is that it's this, it's this big project engaging the city, but it's always the the tunnels here uh, is also a big part of the exhibition. And I've, I've seen over the years some people like be really uncomfortable, like I don't like to do indoor shows, I only want to do the work on the street, enforce these things. Adam, what I, I love about your work is, of course, I loved it on the street, but I think your studio practice has been just next level. Um, and so I think all these artists are dealing with it. Like we've got sometimes these muralists who, 
if you look at their schedule, you're, it's like you think they're in some big band because every day is a different city. And, and a lot of them always struggle to try to get back to the studio practice. You're working, you know, you've got an inside-out thing, uh, Pascal, you've got the, the, the front on the street, but you're working with a lot of artists who quite often they, they practice as, as a kind of public art. Uh, I think it's really interesting what you got, Adrian, because you do work with someone like Jeremy Deller or something like that, people who don't necessarily always do their work in, in this public way. So we have in here a kind of schizophrenia between the studio practice and the public art, and, and it'd be interesting how you guys see these things shifting back and forth in the way you relate to them. I think one of the things I've been really surprised by, the last artist, the artist Taxi Driver, is the, you know, we think of artists, yeah, they're, they're plowing a certain furrow, they're creating a brand, as it were, but what's been eye-opening for me is just seeing the sort of breadth of people's kind of, uh, the work that they do. Um, Mark McGowan, the artist taxi driver, also did a fantastic grime mix that I didn't get um, a chance to show called Shut Down. And he comes from the North Peckham Estate, you know, he... He, he, that is part of his history and he brings all that sort of, he's very political, he brings that to his work, he brings his lived experience to his work and you know, it, he works as a taxi driver to make money so he can carry on doing his art and I wanted to sort of, you know, explore that through the fly posting but also the website as well and to tell a sort of broader story of people's practice. Yeah, for me it was always um, the case of working with artists in the first place, which who happen to use murals as well, but it's just a part of it. Um, um, doing just murals wouldn't be enough, maybe just in case of graffiti, which actually we do a lot as well. Um, but yeah, I'm also more into painting, so like the, the act of painting more, more than anything else and um, yeah um, do you actually encourage people do you get people who are like I don't know I don't really do it and you go like no no try it Here, here's a whole absolutely gallery. and I love to put people together that, that's the kind of thing I love collaborations but sometimes it doesn't work out because some artists don't want to be um, or fear of being diminished by having a collaborative piece but I love to put people together I um, just hey, work together. So this is a cool thing when you have a place, so you have a, a point of focus where people meet and, and they are friends and, and then they can suddenly work together and do something that you wouldn't expect. And that's, that's really great. But, I mean, for you, it's like, I, I know a lot of these artists, uh, they kind of go at their, their studio work as, as these kind of commodified objects when basically their, their other thing is to give their work away for free. And so they kind of treat their studio work as like how they're going to sustain their street practice. But now I'm but your work the is like, of, no, no, because like your, your studio work is getting like such, you're able to do things like that you couldn't really do just entirely on the street. It's, a, yeah. it's so much more conceptual. Yeah, for me, I, I think it's, it's always been uh, like a, the, the practice or the medium uh, never really dictated the concept. It's it's always vice versa. Um, if I have an idea and I I try to figure out how is the the most effective uh, way to convey it, um, how it can reach its most uh, its its highest potential. Uh, so sometimes it would be a mural. Sometimes it would be wheat paste installations outdoors. Uh, more uh, community based or uh, socially driven projects. I think for me, it's, it's been uh, important to kind of start working, like I said uh, before, uh, work with the source and, and not get kind of uh, too deep into representation and uh, being someone else's spokesperson or interpreter or translator or... Um, yeah, so, so the concept usually dictates the way that the, the project will be, will be formed. Um. Yeah, and then one of the things, I mean, I always talk about it as a gaze, but the difference between the studio practice and, and work on, on the street, uh, and I come in, my history really begins actually at that moment when we, we were first thinking of like taking this work off the trains and putting it on canvas, which 
Some people still have not forgiven me for being a part of that because they think we killed graffiti by doing that. But uh, to, I saw a lot of really great graffiti artists kind of just do the same fucking shit they were doing on the trains on canvas and it didn't really work. And then I saw people like Futura and Lee and stuff like that really start learning this other language of painting and stuff like that. And so for me, it's a difference of the gaze that what you do on the street kind of grabs people in a really different way and it's really immediate, but it's, it, you know, it's something you can almost see going by in a car at that pace. But when you put something in a gallery or a museum or in your home, it's something you live with for a really long time and it's a more contemplative gaze. Uh, it's something. So I think you're all probably dealing with it. You probably have to deal with artists sometimes where it's like, yeah, that's fine, but it's, it's not, it's not really working as an art object, or you have to talk to people who make art objects and go like, it's yeah, not, but it's not it's working not on the street, and, not. and then you have to navigate that. So are you, how do you guys negotiate this difference? Usually we, we, we work with artists who absolutely know what they want to do. Like in the case of Tomek, for example, he, he had a very precise idea where he wanted to go, and he's... So is um, he just uh, do it, and we talk. We, but it's he it, it knows. Um, <clears throat> and for him, he has a, he has a way of working which is very precise, and he knows what he's doing, so it's very clear. Um, and outdoor, it's just a, it's just a graffiti, of course, on a deconstructed, abstract way, which is a bit of the Paris way with Orphe and all this pal crew. <clears throat> but um, it's very, very, very different. But I had a talk with Borondo, for example, about it. And he said, you know, he's doing like amazing murals. And he said, yeah, for me, murals is great because I have less, way less pressure than doing a canvas. Because when I'm doing a canvas, I'm watched by Goya, Velasquez, and all the big masters, and it parallelizes me. So this is, is like, um, it's a different thing. So to make him to do a canvas in the course of the residency will be very difficult because maybe he's not in a good mood. Maybe it's not the time. And the difficulty with residencies is to catch up the artist at the very moment where he feels like he's, he's going to do something meaningful and important. And for Tomek, we're very fortunate because he was in the Palais de Tokyo in December last year to do something very important on 500 square meters, like a big outdoor mural. It was becoming to have a kind of recognition and a lot of momentum. And we catch him like two months after, so his first project thereafter. And he was in the perfect confidence, and he delivered something stunning. And he hasn't done better before or so far after. So it's this very important, this momentum, this moment. Yeah, I suppose one of the things I wanted to do was, if you remember the image of the fish, uh, no, Pete Fish, the artist, the image of the moth, um, you know, is tell different sorts of stories. He had this idea of... Um, Darwin's moth, which was a moth that sort of changed its camouflage during the Industrial Revolution. There used to be a white one, but as everything got more grimy, uh, the moth, the white moth died out and the black sort of mottled moth took over because it sort of fitted in with the polluted environment, as you were. And he came up with this idea of a new moth that sort of needed to fit in with sort of neoliberal society. So it took on the sort of brands of uh, consumer culture, hence the sort of Coca-Cola. And he's done a whole series of these. And I just thought, well, they're also made out of children's toys. They're made out of hammer beads, little beads that you iron together. And I was just interested in getting those sorts of stories and opportunities out, getting them in an airing. Pete doesn't have a gallery. He very rarely shows stuff, but at least he's got one piece that now can help sort of circulate his, um, his mad mind, which is exciting. And also I was thinking I wanted to create a kind of niche between sort of, you can get anything printed on anything for pennies these days. Uh, and then you've got the sort of fine art printmaking world. And I just wanted to create something printed on blue backed poster paper that, that was affordable, that people could, you know, it's the price of a night out in the pub. Well, half a night out in Norway, but you know, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> It's just creating opportunities for people, yeah. Did you want to add to that? Or maybe, I don't want to make everyone be redundant, but, because it's also another thing of like, um, the big thing with the mural, but then the, the, the painting that goes in your home, or, or a lot of these more discreet <coughs> things, like these little texts you do on the wall, it's like we don't think of that as public art. Public art kind of stands at a certain 
stature, a, a kind of monumentality. And there's this possibility we're seeing with so many of these intervention artists and stuff like that of, of a much more intimate engagement with your audience. And I think, yeah. I think in a way the fly posters do that as well. It's not, you know, it's, there's something nice about pulling people into a small world instead of just dominating space, I think. Yeah, as I said, it's sort of uh, seeding unexpected images into the environment as part of the thrill for me. Um, you know, it was also supposed to be a job creation scheme for myself, which hasn't quite panned out yet. But, you know, we're getting, we're getting, we're getting interesting art out there in formats that sort of, you know, elude the institutions a little bit or create a new institution, probably, or contribute to, to an existing institution. Do we uh, have time for questions from the audience? Yeah. Does anyone have any questions? I hope yeah, do. I actually wanted to just oh, add, add uh, one thing onto that. Um, I think working uh, in an indoor setting does have that kind of more intimate, it's kind of like using your indoor voice. It allows, it's a vacuum, and you can kind of create your reality, whereas in, in outdoor work, then your, your work kind of becomes humbled by this larger, more powerful, um, uh, happening and I think you know for me it, it, it's both about you know the indoor work can either remind someone of a, of a larger process that or experience a uh, more significant experience that takes place um, in the outdoor interaction and also outdoors it, for me it's always been about kind of creating personal landmarks for people um, because I think that we develop this this kind of relationship and we we create connections with different objects and uh, places and people that, that kind of live around us. So, you know, I, I lived in an apartment in Tel Aviv. It happens a lot in Tel Aviv, the story that I'm going to say, but it, there's like a bike lock that has been locked on the bench outside the apartment for like the six years that I lived there and it never moved. And you start developing these like, you know, these stories and these narratives. Um, and I see creating artwork in public spaces doing the same thing. It's, it allows an opening for uh, interpretation, for questioning, um, and it's just kind of like... A narrative, because yeah. c cities are like a kind yeah. of storytelling. Or a mysterious narrative. Yeah, yeah for surprise, that's yeah. constant. But I like this indoor voice. Have you, I, you know, do you, I, uh, I never... It's Montessori schooling. Yeah, I know, because <laughs> I'm a breeder, so I'm always, you know, you have to tell your kid, like, no, no, use your indoor voice, and I, it's such a good metaphor for art. That's a really, I'm going to have to steal that. And you saw me steal it now, right while we're sitting here. <coughs> Doug, we, we could probably, yeah, please. I would like to ask a question to Pascal. How do you select, like, uh, artists who has right painters? Like, how do you know which artists are going to be your artists? Yeah, it's just, um, um, also, we have a lot of residents, so they might um, <coughs> suggest something. But um, I don't know, it's, it's what I see. Um, and try to to um, to write to the guys and, and do something. But honestly, like for next year, I have still nothing. I have planned nothing. Beautiful. I, yeah, you know, well, it's just like in August, yes. September, and I have some ideas, but uh, I haven't. Nothing is planned. Well, I like Berlin. I'll try to figure out how to become a visual artist and come there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I still you need have, a writing room. <laughs> apartment. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's like um, it's a more like intuitive process. I'm just like. And of course, it's always like um, <clears throat> it's also you you try to to get in contact with some artists that you absolutely want, uh, but they might be not available or not wanting. And sometimes you you are uh, you receive proposal that you don't want. I mean, it's, it's a fact of life. Do you see yourself as something on a really like kind of emerging scale that you, or do you see yourself as something that? people come to later in their, you know what I mean? It's sort of like, are you? Oh yeah, no, we, we work mostly with, um, I don't know what exactly emerging artists mean, but like young artists. Um, yes, and sometimes they, are, they, are, they haven't matured enough, so we try to wait a bit, but yes, we, we mostly with younger artists, but which I think are really good, but yeah, yeah, yeah. younger. It's good to give them a chance. Yeah, yeah, and local also. Like not only foreigners. Cool. Anyone else? Are we good? Does anyone want to get out to that nice day for a minute? All right. Well, then I'll thank everyone for doing this. Thank you. Okay. You can.
can go outside to the weather. You can go outside. Uh, for uh, 15, 20 minutes. Um, but please come back again because we have uh, really good presentations of Lima, Javier, Emma, and Susan. If you don't know their work, you'll be surprised because it's a really deep dive in the culture. Thank you.